I'll call this meeting of the City Council to order. Thank you all for coming. Please rise and join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I could have born and unborn, but that's okay. That's okay. Meetings. So, for the record, uh, staff is here with the exception of John Coleman, since he lives up in Whatcom and has several feet of snow to walk through. We've uh, let him off for the evening. They're in a state of emergency up there. Council are present with the exception of Council Member Johnson. Do I hear a motion to excuse Council Member Johnson? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to excuse Council Member Johnson. Second. Tonight's meeting. Okay, a motion was made by Councilmember Kinzer and seconded by Councilmember Lemley to excuse Councilmember Johnson's absence. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And I, she is excused by unanimous vote. Next on the agenda is the consent calendar. We have items A through D. I move we accept the consent calendar as stated. Okay, a motion was made by Councilmember Judith Dunley, seconded by Councilmember Kinzer. To approve the consent calendar items A through D, is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And it carries unanimously. Next up is a special presentation um, by Joe Valentine, Executive Director of the North Sound Behavioral Center and uh, one of our partners working on uh, behavioral health. So Joe, thank you for coming and uh, look forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I appreciate the opportunity to update you on our work to create needed behavioral health treatment facilities in the North Sound region. Uh, the North Sound Behavioral Health Organization is responsible for managing the public dollars for mental health treatment and substance use treatment in the five county North Sound region. Uh, so just a little background, I will. And, uh, in our region, there is a growing unmet crisis and need for behavioral health uh, treatment services. Uh, back in April, the state decided to combine uh, treatment dollars for substance use with the treatment dollars for mental health services. So we uh, then became responsible for both those services. One of the things that we quickly discovered is that we are, have a, a real lack of treatment beds in this region for substance use treatment services. Uh, we are the second largest region in the state and we probably have the fewest beds per person uh, in the state. So we have a real crisis and that crisis was driven in part by rapid population growth in the five county North Sound region uh, as well as you know the opioid epidemic which has hit this area particularly hard and we quickly discovered we did not have the treatment resources in particular to treat drug addiction. The uh, substance use treatment system historically has been, has been focused on alcoholism and it just became overwhelmed when the opioid epidemic hit. So we've been working with our partners, uh, Skagit County, the Port of Skagit, and uh, City of Cedro Rilly, to try to identify what, what kind of treatment facilities do we need in the North Sound region. So I'll briefly update you on what, we, what our plan is, what we've discovered, and give you an update on our progress in getting the funding that we need to implement that plan. So the two-sided handout uh, that I gave you uh, briefly summarizes some of the uh, issues that led us to this. Uh, in particular, we have two real crises. One is with people that are suffering a severe psychiatric crisis. Uh, there's insufficient beds in this region. A lot of those people end up being cared for in the emergency department, which really isn't the best place to be if you're suffering a mental health crisis. Uh, and secondly, as I indicated, the opioid epidemic has hit us really hard. In the North Sound region, the number of deaths due to opioid 
overdose are way out of proportion to our population. So we have some of the highest incidence of opioid deaths and overdoses in the North Sound region. So we have been working to identify in the ideal world how many treatment beds do we need. One of the things, we discovered two things when we became responsible for, for substance use treatment services. The first is that most of the people that need residential treatment go over to Eastern Washington to get that treatment because we don't have enough beds in this region. And in particular, the beds that we have here, such as at Pioneer Center North, <clears throat> are traditionally used for what's called long-term treatment, which is 60 to 90 days. But most people don't need that length of treatment. They need a shorter period of treatment. And what they need is that when they come out of a treatment facility, there needs to be something there to help them with their recovery. And one of the things that happens is many people will come out of treatment, they either can't find housing, they can't get a job, or they relapse back into their former patterns. When we looked at the data, we saw that there was a 70 to 80 percent recidivism rate for people coming out of residential treatment. So they were just cycling through residential treatment. So what that led us to do, working with Skagit County, who has developed what's called a recovery model of treatment, is to put more emphasis on treating people in the community and then put more emphasis on having something there for people when they come out of residential treatment. So that's part of the philosophy behind our plan. <clears throat> So we calculated how many beds in the ideal world we would need and how much it would cost. And we put together a wish list. Uh, and then we realized that, so we need uh, money for the legislature to build the facilities. We have the money to pay for ongoing treatment, but we need help building the facilities. Uh, and the dollar amount was pretty large. So being realistic, uh, we decided to prioritize. So for the next biennium, the, the reverse uh, side shows what some of our priority needs are. Uh, one is for an evaluation of treatment facility located somewhere in Skagit County. Uh, these are the facilities that instead of taking a person to an emergency department, you can take them to the evaluation and treatment facility. Uh, we need smaller substance use treatment facilities. Uh, the magic number is 16, and the reason that's a magic number is the federal government will not let us use Medicaid dollars to pay for treatment in facilities with more than 16 beds. And using Pioneer Center North as an example, uh, in June, we will only be able to pay for treatment up there with state dollars. So that puts a real limit on our ability to pay for treatment. So we're looking to build smaller facilities that we can use Medicaid dollars for, and facilities that are much more amenable to, to providing therapy to people. It's, it's much easier to get therapy in a smaller, uh, warmer facility than in a large institutional facility. So we're looking for funding to build uh, small facilities. Uh, we have a couple of good opportunities. In Everett, uh, they're going to use, they're going to convert much of what was the Juvenile Justice Treatment Center, which is a Denny Center, and convert those to adult treatment beds. Uh, the reason for that is that most of Denny Juvenile Justice Center sits vacant because we don't lock up juveniles as much as we used to. Uh, so we're able to use that county-owned property. In Bellingham, they already have a small triage center on county-owned property. Uh, it's insufficient in terms of providing a crisis center, and so they want to build two 16-bed uh, facilities on that piece of property. Then in Skagit County, we are looking for what's called a stabilization campus, where we can locate a 16-bed mental health treatment center and a 16-bed detox center, and eventually move the 16-bed crisis center in Burlington onto that campus. campus. One of the reasons for that is law, to give law enforcement one place they can bring people in crisis, regardless of what the crisis is, a one-stop shopping, a uh, one-stop drop-off for law enforcement. Uh, we often hear stories from Skagit Sheriff and police. They literally sometimes spend time driving around looking for a bed to, uh, looking for a place that will take people. Um, 
So those are on our priority list. Uh, the other thing that's on our priority list is to build a small crisis center somewhere in West Gadget County that could be accessible to Island County and San Juan County. In Island and San Juan County, there are no crisis centers at all. Uh, law enforcement is basically stuck when they pick up somebody in a crisis. Uh, their only option is to drive them all the way over to Burlington to the crisis center there. So those are our priorities for the first biennium. Uh, the total cost we estimate to be 41 million. We've been able to save some of our own money, and so we've given money to Skagit, Rock, and Snohomish as seed money. That's about eight and a half million dollars. So we're asking for 32 and a half million dollars for the legislature to help us build these facilities. Uh, we're having some real success in Olympia. We've been working with uh, Strategies Three. 60, uh, and uh, Commissioner Dahlstedt has been down there talking to legislators. I understand that Senator Pearson has already introduced our request on the Republican side. Uh, Senator Lewis is going to do so uh, on the Democratic side. And in the House, we've had a lot of support from Representatives uh, Norma Smith and Gene Robinson and Steve Thoringer. So there's a lot of support for our request. Uh, I think the legislature recognizes that behavior Behavioral health services are a real need at this point. Uh, of course, they're struggling with the fact that we do have a, a financial need for schools as well, so that's competing with these dollars. But I think we'll have some success. Uh, however, it takes a while to build these kind of facilities, so we're not waiting to hear from the legislature. We have a second track going where we're actually beginning to plan for building the facilities. Uh, Snohomish County is contracted with an architect who's already doing the design for the facility in Everett, and we're working with a professional project management firm called Cumming, who is literally helping us look at parcels of land in Skagit County so that we can begin identifying some possible locations. So hopefully when we get some funding from legislature, we'll be able to hit the ground running in terms of, of uh, going forth and trying to build some of these facilities. So I'll stop there, and I don't know, uh, Tim, if you want to add anything. Or... You're, you're certainly welcome to, Tim. And uh... Go ahead, if you like. I'd like to bring Council's attention to pages, uh, so starting on page 33, there are some slides that will probably help uh, elucidate the, on the brief, and this is, we'll talk about this later, because it's one of our legislative priorities when we go down to Olympia next week. Um, some of our Council members and myself will be going down to uh, talk to lawmakers and support this. Go. So first off, uh, I'm Tim Horn with uh, Skagit County. I'm the administrator. I want to thank you as a strong partner. As you know, we're trying to convert or transform Northern State to a, an economic engine. The big controversy there was Pioneer Center North eventually will have to be displaced. In the evaluation and treatment center that Joe talked about, that's fairly new, will have to come off that campus. So that kind of got us into this business. How are we going to take care of our local people? So we did a lot of studies, as Joe mentioned. And what we found out is that if you keep people local, their family and support system is close to them. So we have people coming all the way up from Thurston County, getting treated up in Cedar Woolley. They're away from their families. So the model is to build the facilities locally work regionally because we can't afford those facilities in all our counties. So there might be some services down in, you know, for maybe pregnant women in certain places and young people in different counties. We're going to cooperate in the five county region because we can't afford it. The bottom line is the current system isn't working. When 70 to 80 percent of the people are going through dry out time and time again, it's not working. What we found out is there are some models with recovery coaches. Um, it's used nationwide in different areas. Joe's talking to the people in Olympia about a pilot program where they would certify recovery coaches in this region first. So if, if I have a problem and I, I use or used to use and I feel like I'm slipping, I've got somebody that I can talk to who will support me along the way before I fall back with my same group of people 
And again, the other piece that Joe talked about is a good percentage of these people are homeless. So Skagit County concurrently is working on the homeless issue. We have a proposal out there for a 60 bed unit for stabilization for people. And we're, we're actually gonna, the commissioners are gonna invite council members. Um, we're gonna have a tour of the facilities up in Whatcom County. They have some very successful programs up there. City council members up there and the mayor are willing to talk about. There was a lot of controversy that people didn't want it in their neighborhood. It's in the Colchon area, and it's it's actually a beautiful facility. And the way they treat people is they don't treat the, they could be using. It's they have to conform to the behaviors. If they don't behave and follow the rules in the facility, they're out. And they have a homeless transition team. If they have to go back out in the street, they have somebody that helps them. But they basically have to comply with behaviors. It's a pretty successful model. But you know, it's kind of like when we built the jail. We, we took tours of different jails in the area to, so people can actually see what they look like and what worked and didn't work. This summer, uh, we're getting pretty close with opening a new jail. Again, that's another partnership that's successful. We're hoping to open sometime this summer. Uh, we're June, July, somewhere around there, 400 beds. There's a second phase for additional 400 beds. None of us in this room want to see the 400 beds, the additional 400 beds built. When you take a look at 70, 80 percent of the people in our jail that have problems with mental health or substance use, they don't get the treatment they need in the jail. We need people in the jail that break the law. The people who need treatment need that treatment. So we are looking for these facilities to help deflect some of the stuff that happens in our jails. You know, a lot of times the criminal behavior is because they're on the street, they're desperate, they need services, it's expensive to serve them in the emergency department, they're overwhelmed. A lot of times a pol your police officer has to stay with them until they dry out or whatever. So it's, it's the system doesn't work. I think the system that with Joe and what in the region that we're looking at, and this is a system that we think the whole state can replicate. So we're hoping that the state will invest in this North Sound area in a system that we think is going to work, that's going to collect data, cut down on the recidivism or the relapses, and then other areas in the state can follow the same model. I, again, I'm a lay person. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't live it like Joe. But I think, um, I was at the Law and Justice Council meeting today, and they were talking about the opioids. It's unbelievable. We gotta do something about it. I know anywhere on the streets, you gotta look where people are staying homeless and how many needles you see on the ground. It's just out of control. And a lot of it's our young people. So we gotta change the system. We have to get into the schools, we have to identify this, we have to educate people. So we have a whole track in Skagit County on the opioid epidemic. And we're trying to address that as well. So. I guess with that, I open it up in any questions. So for the council, the uh, that recovery path that was alluded to, that's on uh, page 34 of our packets. You mm -hmm. can get an idea of what Tim and Joe are talking about. And I appreciate all the work. I've taken a couple of detailed briefs from Joe, and it, you've really done some great work here. Any questions from the council? Maybe not a question, but I um, I know you get a, a million suggestions of what to do in the county, but I wonder if you consider the current jail site I mean, it has regional access. It's close to the justice and other services in, in that area. Um, and it fits the timeline with the new jail completion and, and development at Northern State. Is that an option for any of these? Um, uh, any of these, you know, either from housing to, or to treatment? Yep. I, I guess I can address that. Um, we're trying to deal with the city of Mount Vernon on where, where to locate the stabilization campus. Um, early on, we brought up the concept uh, on the same site, and there's a stigma to that. We would love to put the stabilization somewhere in the same region, because the law enforcement coming in might come over to the new jail and they say, not fit for jail, you got a problem here. If the stabilization's adjacent to that, it makes a whole lot of sense. So again, it's um, part of it is convincing the city of Mount Vernon that that's a good location. I gotta tell you, we had no opposition when we put a jail down there. There aren't many neighbors. You know, there, there isn't a lot of residents in South Mount Vernon. Yeah. So it makes a whole lot of sense, but we need to work with the city of Mount Vernon, convince them that that's a good location. 
you know, when you do the stabilization, the concept is they're in there to, to take care of their problems. They're not coming and going. So that's usually the issue. If you're close to the downtown corridor, they don't want people coming back and forth. This is stabilization. There's a recovery campus that we're talking about. That's more the housing, and it's where the where, that's where people need to be fairly connected to the community on the bus line and get a job, those types of things. But you're you're thinking along the same lines we are. South Mount Vernon would be ideal. Well, I know, not not South Mount Vernon, but I was thinking just the actual jail today. The, uh, so the, the actual jail today, the difficulty there is we have our court downstairs in the sheriff's office, and originally when they talked about building a new jail, they were going to build a new sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. And we felt like the taxpayers shouldn't have to pay for a new sheriff's office. So we pulled that out of the jail. So we are actually going to expand a lot of our sheriff's office upstairs. Okay. They're going to use some of it for training. We're going to put our um, technology upstairs out of the floodplain. In a court system, it's amazing. We all talk about going paperless. Boxes and boxes and boxes of paper for courts. We have to store those somewhere. An old jail, using the walls in an old jail. The problem with repurposing an old jail, if it was standalone, you can do a lot of stuff. But the district court's downstairs, the sheriff's office, and you have to jackhammer out all the um, the bars and all that stuff. It, it's yeah. pretty expensive to repurpose it. So I might want to add one thing. The stigma, uh, too. Right. We don't want a treatment facility to feel like a jail. Well, no, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'd imagine you would remodel it, but it right. just seems like a, it's so close to you know all the services and, right. and regional like access. We, we took so. a hard look at it, but it's too expensive to repurpose it, and the fact that we need to expand the sheriff's office, use it some for training, we have the courts over there. So if we had a problem in the court system and we had a delay, we can take the people that are supposed to make a court appearance, keep them in a holding area there as well. So um, again, it wouldn't be cost effective to convert it. We've had people saying, can you make it housing? Can you do this? If it was a standalone facility, it would have a lot more options, but it, it doesn't. So, But South Mount Vernon is an ideal location. When I say South Mount Vernon, and I'm talking south of the post office all the way down to where the jail is. Because um, there's some, there's a lot of property for sale. Well, especially um, where the jail is being built now. Yes. That, that's all, almost all vacant. So, or, well, you know, and then easily. And, yep, the company that Joe's talking to, we're looking at a lot of those sites. But again, just like you were at council, if it was in Cedar Woolley, we'd have to come to you and say, we want to locate this facility in a certain neighborhood. You have to weigh the options, the pros and cons, and, and look out for what's best for the city of Siege of Wally. The, the, the Mount Vernon Council, we need to convince them that it's a good location. When you take a look, a lot of the social services, they're in Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. A lot of treatment facilities, a DSHS, models, they're all, so it makes sense to try to locate it close so they can have the services they need. Great I have a question for you. I was wondering about the one that's located, or I don't know how many are located in Whatcom County right now. And what about that location? Where's so, like where's that? What area is that location? Right, right now in Whatcom County, they have a parcel of land next to the jail, and they have what's called a crisis triage center there. Uh, it's it's inadequate. It has some beds for substance use and some for mental health. Law enforcement frequently don't bring people there uh, because it's really not adequate. And based on how many people get dropped off at the emergency department, they really need two facilities on that piece of property, one for mental health and one for, one for substance use. And that's what their proposal is. And they're putting some county dollars in it, too. Right. Thanks. So, so it's interesting that we, we separate substance use and mental health. A lot of time it's co-occurring. It's the rules are changing and morphing. But a lot of these folks that you meet, you wonder if they had a mental health problem first or a substance issue. Cur currently they have both problems, a lot of these people. You talk to Charlie up in the jail and, um, you know, it's, we're struggling. Our, our staff's struggling with how to treat people. And, you know, they kind of are tough on each other, too. So, Anybody else, Council? So um, we've 
we put this model up here, and I've heard you speak kind of eloquently about how this was developed, where it's worked well. I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, if you could describe the model and, and why we think it's a better model, I'd appreciate it. Right, and this is, was developed in conjunction with Skagit County Human Services. I, I need you to speak to the mic, Joe, so everybody can it hear. It was developed please. in conjunction with Skagit County Human Services, so you can see one of the key uh, services here is housing, and uh, Tim talked about that. A lot of people sit in treatment facilities like Pioneer Center North longer than they need to, simply because they don't have housing. So uh, housing and then recovery coaches. So uh, getting over a substance use disorder or an opioid addiction, that doesn't happen overnight. And they really need to have somebody who's with them for the whole duration of the treatment, from outpatient through inpatient and back into the community. So treatment has to be accompanied by the recovery coach. Uh, and then, you know, one of the big issues for people coming out of treatment, if they don't have a job or they don't have a job skills, they're really going to fall back into, they're easily going to fall back into addiction. So uh, getting somebody, helping somebody recover is not just a matter of treatment, it's getting them housed and getting them a job. So it's really kind of looking at the complete package in terms of supporting recovery. And there's some documentation to back up the success rate. I think we were, I heard it called the Oregon model or the Portland model or something earlier. There's a central city concern down in Portland has done the most work where they have treatment and housing uh, and help with jobs all in the same area. And they do have a, a big success rate. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you so much for coming, and uh, we look forward to uh, supporting you when we go down to the legislature next week. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is public comment period. For the public comment period, please remember you're addressing the council and not the audience. Um, limit your comments to three minutes, and who would like to be first? Yes, please. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening. I'm Loretta Sarnan, and I reside at 821 Park Cottage Place, and I am a resident and taxpayer in the city of Seaford Woolley. And I read the wonderful public relations article today in the paper, and I have some questions as a taxpayer. And I want to direct these questions to um, to. Mayor Wagner, to Mr. Berg, and then to the council members who went ahead and approved this proposal. Uh, my first question is, how many of your constituents were consulted about the use of these funds for an entity? These are, we're talking about taxpayers' dollars, public funds going to an entity, the YMCA, YWCA, wonderful organizations don't have an issue with them, just have an issue with their taxpayer dollars being used in this way. I know, written an article, um, that they're going to also be approaching other municipalities in the county and they're taking it under consideration. I want to know, Mayor and Mr. Berg and council members, if you spoke with department heads um, to see if maybe $10,000 dollars in the next five years could make a difference and a direct difference and an immediate difference as the speaker was saying of course you're here to look out for the interests of the citizens of Cedar Willie and so would that ten thousand dollars be more effectively used within our own departments have immediate impact instead of waiting till 2019 to get a benefit of one night a month which I assume is in a contract that, uh, that we'll have swimming free for all Seaford really residents at this time. So the reason I'm here is because as a taxpayer, as a resident, as a concerned citizen, my questions are, was what was the context of this decision to be made? And did it need to be made so quickly? And who determined the amount? How 
is this time? And where is this money coming from? As a taxpayer, I would like to know. You know, you're used to me up here talking about the library, and I can't even be projected costs on that. So I'm thinking, wow, you guys have got money because you were able to get 50000 commit to 10000 a year. These are the questions I have. And my other thing is it makes me wonder, are you properly representing us? Are you doing the best with our funds? If this is one example, what are other things that I don't know about? Because if it wasn't for this public relations piece, I would not have heard about this. And I found it very interesting at the end where um, the yeah, well, speaking. Seconds, right? Okay, all right. This right now, the facility opened. See the rule in membership through anticipating will go from 884 to about 2600. So this is the appropriate thing to do, is let the membership pay for the pool. And let's use our dollars here in our community and for our local government. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, at this time. Oh, Dennis. Dennis. Got to be quick. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, Dennis O'Neill. I reside at 109 Talcott Street. Um, been there for, I don't know, 10 years or so, 11, 12. Been in town for about 20. Uh, I'm also calling, uh, talking about the uh, YMCA. Uh, I think it look, took a lot of courage for Jermaine to make, an, make a motion, and, and I was both surprised and happy she did because Chuck had brought up some issues, Brett had brought up some, Brenda had brought up some issues, and then she made a motion uh, for low end to 30,000, which is uh, not what you know Keith wanted. He wanted 50. He explained to us why, and uh, and Brenda seconded it. And I was caught a little bit surprised that there wasn't a vote at that point among the council members. And that, in fact, uh, Julie jumped in and made a counter motion. I thought that when a person makes a motion and is seconded, that there should be a vote on that. I didn't think there was endless motions could be made, you know between that period and the, and the decision, and I was disappointed that the mayor let it occur. I, I, and I also didn't even realize that that was the city council meeting of where you could actually pass a vote like that. I thought that was a workshop, and most of these things that were brought out in the public, you know, on the agenda would be something dealt with in here on a regular scheduled basis. So I learned something, and I would recommend anybody that's interested in what's going on in the city to go to the workshops now. Um, the other thing I didn't really understand is is why they aren't recorded. I thought there was a state law. Maybe maybe they were recorded. I don't know, Aaron. But I thought there was a state law where you had to keep records of any public meetings, especially when the money was involved. Uh, but that didn't happen. And. You know, I, I'm a little silly on this stuff. I'm just learning. So sometimes I offend people, and I think I've offended Aaron a couple times, and I apologize for that. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the best way to do things. Uh, one of the comments I made was get a contract attorney to review those documents before we sign anything regarding the library. About 30 and, seconds. Yeah, and I found that, you know, he had done that, but I wondered how much had been available to the public. I don't know of anything I read about an attorney looking at it. But, I, you know, I'm just sum it up, it seems like we're getting more to Big Brother rather than a democracy. I elected, and I voted for I voted for Keith, and I like to see them get a little bit more respect from other council members. I don't think it should have happened where somebody could interject before a motion's voted on, or should be allowed to by the mayor, who, or whoever is in charge that night. But I admire Jermaine for standing up and making that motion. It's not easy to do something that, when somebody else wants something else. I admire Brenda for, you know, uh, seconding it, and Chuck for talking about it, and Brett too. And I was disappointed that it doesn't seem like there's a lot of respect among all of you up there for each other. And we're sort of leaning to one person, and not picking the mayor out too much, but, you know, you got to stand up for the people that elected you, and that's the citizens of town. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dennis. Yep. Mr. Mayor, if I might ask, just Aaron, 
when I, I kind of peeked through Robert's rules. It's kind of convoluted. It's you know complicated. But if there's a motion made and seconded, it, then generally we discuss. Isn't that correct? And then in that discussion, if someone makes a motion to amend, like Julia did, then that could get a second. Is that is that proper? That's exactly yeah, right. That's exactly and, right. And Dennis, um, you know, and anybody is welcome to attend the training that we'll have here in this room on the 22nd at 3:30. It's a public meeting, so uh, the city council, the library board, the planning commission have all been invited, and you'll. You know, you'll get to learn from a master parliamentarian that night, and uh, I don't know if she'll be able to take questions from the public, but I'm sure she'll be available after the meeting to take a question or two, and she'll actually practice with the group how that works. You know, how you take a main motion, you have uh, secondary motions, and you know, there's a whole precedence of motions, but amending a motion is entirely proper, and what happened at the work session, which by the way, under state law, is a regular council meeting. They're Free to act like they do at any other meeting, and minutes are taken, although they are not audio or video recorded. Um, you know what? What happened there was you had a motion, a second, followed by discussion, followed by a motion to amend that was seconded, discussed, voted on, and then the new motion, that is the amended motion, became the motion on the floor, and that was uh, further discussed and voted on and ultimately passed. So. Uh, I think the parliamentary process was exactly right. Everyone had an opportunity to speak, and uh, ultimately the council as a body made a decision. And also to clarify, that was our, the second time and was held previously. I know Sarah and has left, but that was a, oh, yeah. the second meeting that we've had regarding right, so that topic. Sorry that she missed that. It wasn't the council packet, so the questions that, that uh, Ms. Saarinen asked about funding sources, etc., were in the original council packet. Yeah. So we're still in public comment period. Is there anyone else who would like to comment? Harold, come on up. Jameson Street. I get to agree with the gentleman's here a minute ago. I was caught off base. When I was here two weeks ago, it was my understanding that this was the deal with the YMCA was shelved for the night. You're going to have a workshop for it. Now I read the paper where we're going to give $50,000 to the YMCA. No vote. Now, my understanding that uh, any any money is voted on or any ordinance is passed has to be done in council chambers, not at a workshop. Now may, maybe I'm in error here. But that's been the understanding. And like I say, I put two terms on the council myself. My understanding that you can discuss it, maybe even take a straw vote if you want to. That's no problem. But tonight supposedly we come on board and we we're going to have a vote yes or no we're going to give fifty thousand dollars of our money away i asked aaron a few days ago how many people from cedar really are members of the y i never i didn't get an answer back from him because i didn't think he got it i left he said voice he didn't know me I, I left a voicemail held on your cell phone i didn't get it Anyway, in the paper tonight, I see it was 880. Well, Cedar Woolley address is a large area. Skagit River, north, the Watkins County line, even into Watkins County. Up River, to, up above Birdview, and back to around the Collins Road out here. Cedar Woolley City is about 11,400, I think, in population. Okay. How many of that 11,000 are members of the Y? Now, I, before we get too far into this, don't get me wrong, I'm not against the Y. I've used the Y in the past. In fact, I taught Sindab in over for several years. No problem. But I just don't see us giving $50,000 to the YMCA in Mount Vernon. 
the Bible word people will, will get the use of it. Not seed or woolly. Very, very few people. Who's going to get in the car and drive to Mount Vernon to go Jewish women? That's you. Cut about be. 30 seconds, Harold. And another thing, as far as the drownings that I brought up, I said I drove, I drove on a great percentage of every drowning in Skagit County for a little over 10 years. Most of them, like I said, just to be to turn pretty, pretty heavily with stupidity. I can only remember about once or twice actual swimmers drowning. Most of them are fishermen or somebody that was in either labor work or some type of work where there was heavily dressed, heavy boots. They got in the water, they were gone. There's no way you can swim with a pair of cork boots on, a pair of barn boots on. That's about on. time, Harold. Time's up. Okay. I preach for the time, but again, I'd like to see a vote on this from the council, and I hope you people remember in the council, I'm going over time, I realized, but there's a very important thing here. You people, each one of you, represent your districts. Harold, your, your time is up and the council has already voted. So I'd ask that you please sit down to respect the three minute limit. I'm sorry to get it to interrupt you and take a little bit of your time, but I think it's very important that these people understand that they are representing the people. I wonder how many of you people actually went out and talked to any of your constituents about this deal with the YMCA, about giving this money out, my tax dollars. How many of you did? Good question. Thank you. Okay, anybody else for public comment? At this time, I'll close the public comment period. I would like to point out um, that at 11 minutes from the Jameson Roundabout for Cedar Woolley, the YMCA's location time-wise is going to be closer for many Cedar Woolley residents than it's going to be for Mount Vernon residents because there's only one stop sign once you hit Highway 9. So we're actually closer in terms of time invested than the majority of Mount Vernon citizens are. Mr. Mayor, I read that same thing, double checked it three times now. And if I'm real lucky, I can make it 12 minutes not pushing the speed off the limit all the way. So actually, 12 minutes is a little bit off. I did more of a say 15 to 20 minutes like get done. Well, I would respectfully disagree. I've driven it myself a couple times. Okay, next item. No, thank you. So we'll now move on to unfinished business. Um, item six, New City website overview with Bill Chambers, our IT director and department head of one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Chambers, IT Director, that's Information Technology, and... Uh, Bill, I need you to move your mic closer so people can hear, please. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So uh, we rolled out the new website last week, and a um, couple of little um, issues here and there, but pretty much uh, everything's uh, up and running smoothly. Um, I'll pull it up here so some of you can see uh, the home page. The reason we uh, redesigned it uh, is basically to, to make it a little more um, uh, dynamic so that when you are looking at it on a smartphone or a tablet or some other mobile device as well as a PC, um, it uh, resizes and it's as usable as, as uh, it is on a large uh, screen. The old website just didn't do that. Um, main page, you got uh, uh, multiple access to uh, different items, front and center, city council meeting materials, planning commission meeting materials, FAQs, and a lot of people are really interested in finding out if we've picked up their dog on the road, so we put that there. Um, it's amazing how many hits that gets. <laughs> uh, uh, on 
on the top of every page, we've got uh, um, the departments up here and uh, links to all of those. We've got uh, resources here for ADA resources, um, bill pay, bids and awards, city directory, all that good stuff. One new item uh, is the e-notifications. And uh, that page basically allows you to go in and uh, put in your email address here, <coughs> sign in, and then double uh, down here on this list, you can subscribe to a number of pages by email email or by text and get notifications whenever those, whenever the uh, content of those ch pages change. So if you wanted to uh, keep an eye out for uh, new bids or awards, uh, you'd click on this guy here. Uh, or if you wanted to keep an eye on to see what animals had pick been picked up, uh, you'd click this one. Uh, some folks might be interested in the, um, uh, the employment opportunities, uh, say, so they subscribe to that. Um, on the right hand side here, every page, uh, you've got the ability to pin it um, to Pinterest. You've got uh, tweet. Uh, for those who tweet, Facebook, you can print the page, you can email to somebody, and um, there are other options too. By pressing the plus, you see that uh, there's not enough room to show everything in there, so that expands that. Let's see, under governing bodies, uh, under the city council meetings, we uh, uh, are now hosting the, the videos uh, via YouTube. So uh, when you click on those, it actually opens up a, a link to YouTube. And there we go. And we'll start playing the video here. Good evening, shortly. everybody. I'll call this meeting to um, would you please rise? And so under YouTube, you can also, for folks that want to look at these items outside of our website, uh, we have different playlists for uh, like the 2016 videos, 2015 miscellaneous videos, and 2017 videos. Let's see. And uh, another new item. Uh, the requests, citizens request page. Uh, here, citizens are able to enter, uh, select an item like um, uh, stormwater or streets or uh, the most uh, important pothole reports, and put in your name here, Joe Public. If I can type. your email address here and phone number and then describe your issue down below select whether or not you want uh, to be res to re the response to be via email or phone and click on this little I'm not a robot bit and submit after selecting uh, verifying uh, images with street signs or storefronts or uh, whatever that's just basically to make sure that uh, you're a real person and not um, a bot and submit it and that will go to the department um, that uh, it, it's necessary to send it to. Um, let's see, for folks that uh, are looking for quick links to, to items, council items, uh, this is probably your best bet here. Um, there's also links here on the calendar. Uh, for council meetings by clicking on those it'll take you to let's see it's not moving there we go council materials and take you to that council materials page where you can get agendas and packets and whatnot um, also on the what was that on the calendar, you can expand that calendar and view all events. That takes you to the full calendar page. And on here, right now, we've just got um, the master calendar but uh, and the uh, solid waste calendar. 
Uh, in the future, we may have uh, uh, parks and rec calendar, uh, different calendars that you can choose from to see specific uh, events that are related to those. And that's about all I've got. If you've got any questions. Bill, can you pull up the uh, city ordinance page? Sure. Because this is one I find. You know, people say, well, where does it say that? Municipal yeah, code. Municipal code. It's a searchable base. And I don't know if you want to know about pet ownership or barking dogs. Up in the top right, you can search it. And it will take you to the right section. And you can read what our ordinances are. Pretty useful. Here you can find out how many chickens you can keep. All right. Anything else? Council, you have any questions for Bill? Looks great. If, uh, if any of you are having troubles on your devices uh, reaching the, the new website, um, sometimes you cache the address for the old website, which is a little different. So be sure and just clear your cache, and you'll be able to pull it up OK. And if you need help, let me know. This was a significant investment of Bill's time. And also, I think you had some help from Julie down in planning to to make this all right, although we had it built by a contractor, you have to tell them where you want every little thing. So uh, I appreciate all the time you spent tweaking this and testing it and uh, rolling it out. And if anybody has any problems, let Bill know, because I sure don't know how to fix it. All set. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Okay, item seven under new business, the 2017 legislative priorities. So we had a brief earlier by Joe on, uh, on a portion of that. And Aaron, did you want to introduce this? Sure. So we've got uh, three council members, the mayor and I, going to Olympia next week. And we always Page have 29 a list in your of concerns with us. So what I put in the packet for you are the three kind of top city-oriented objectives. Uh, I've also put um, the Skagit County legislative priorities as well as the Association of Washington City legislative priorities, which you saw, I think, last fall, sort of coming into this session. So on the city side, the three requests that we've got on the list uh, is funding the capital budget request for the library. This is a carryover from last year, although larger. The North Sound BHO request that Joe talked about, this is within the confines of our partnership between the city, the county, and the port, to which the city has already contributed $6,000 on legislative advocacy this year. Um, and then last one is the RCO grant program. Our project is for the Memorial Park revitalization is sitting kind of right on the bubble of funding or not funding. So fully funding RCO at the requested levels of the Washington Wildlife and Recreation Program, the WWRP, would give our project the most um, likely success, a path of success to funding. So I don't know if you have any specific questions. Uh, you know, the packet, I, I think we've got materials for each item that provides a, a decent detail. I put the county and AWC lists in here in case there are broader issues of concern. At this point, I think we're uh, scheduled to meet with seven members of the legislature over the two-day period. You know, in my experience, you don't want to hit hit them with more than about three items. And in our case, uh, we've got three heavy lifts, you know, uh, three fairly significant capital items. So, so remind me, is it the four of us that are going? All right, here. So um, I would offer also that, uh, and usually we only get about 10 or 15 minutes, but if somebody has an anecdotal thing that if we had time to bring up, um, I would be happy to do that. We could talk about it. I know I have I have a personal issue. It's not a city thing that I'm going to talk about when I get down there. It has to do with the reintroduction of grizzly bears into our backyard. But uh, that's not technically a city thing. But I, I will bring it up if I get time. You want more grizzlies? Um, I don't want grizzlies living with my parents upriver, no. <laughs> but that's, you know, I, I understand there's people who think that's a great idea. I'm just not one of them. So, so, any, any questions on any of the priorities presented? So um, the recommended motion is on page 
looking at page number 29 at the bottom of the page. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the three priorities as the city's legislative priorities for the 2017 sessions. Okay, motion is made by Councilmember Sandstrom and seconded by Councilmember Owen to approve the three priorities as the city's legislative priorities for the 2017 session. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? And it carries unanimously. We, we do address other legislative issues as they come up, and, and we'll call upon council members who have relationships. I know Council Member Cornegay and I drove down last session and camped out in the speaker's office for about half a day in order to get get an unscheduled meeting. And so issues like the Public Records Act, some of the AWC priority items will follow up on. There was an issue that uh, Mayor Boudreaux took to Olympia today and I think had some success that uh, Mayor Wagner signed on to along with uh, the mayors of Anacortes and Burlington dealing with um, pole attachment legislation that would supersede local government authority to determine what facilities would look like within each city's right of way. So the, you know, there are issues that crop up and certainly if any issues come to your attention, you know, let us know so we can be coordinating how we address that on behalf of Cedar Woolley. Okay, let's move on to reports. Chief Tucker. Just a couple of things. Um, you may see some activity in the, I remember what this building's called across the road here. We use it for training the old, the Skagit plant offices over here. I call it an eyesore, but okay. Uh, we're going to be doing some active shooter training. The uh, uh, We've got a countywide training going on where all of our departments have a instructor or two, or we've got three, uh, to train on uh, active shooter uh, response techniques. And we're going to be over there. So if you see lots of stuff going on, looks like SWAT stuff going on, that's what we're doing over there. We'll be uh, over there on Friday. Um, they're in class when, uh, today, tomorrow, and then working techniques in the building over there. They love that building, and the SWAT team may want to do a little training in there if they can convince Todd it's a good idea. Um, we've had some uh, discussions over some homeless issues. Um, probably several people have dealt with a couple of our homeless folks that are living downtown. Um, we're trying to come up with some uh, solutions to some of the problems going on. It's difficult. Uh, Joe talked a little bit about some of the um, issues that he's having. These are the issues that we've been facing for years. Uh, mental health is virtually non-existent unless you are deep in the system. Uh, drug and alcohol addiction issues are uh, they're hard to find a resolution for. And most of the folks we're dealing with on the street are two or three homeless versus the two or three hundred that Mount Vernon has. Um, we have those issues. So we're working through some solutions and working with the court on a couple, resolving some court issues with them. But uh, uh, I guess rest assured, if you have any ideas, let us know. But uh, we're still trying to work with the system, trying to figure out kind of a way to work out those problems. And finally, uh, we're going to be probably in the next month or two bring in some uh, uh, code updates to the council. Uh, since we've taken on the commercial vehicle enforcement, we found that um, our adoption of the model traffic ordinance by WAC and RCW hasn't covered all of the issues that um, Officer Eddie is confronting on commercial vehicles. So we may have to adopt a few more of the RCWs into CD Will and Municipal Code. There's a pathway for that and it'll involve Aaron and our prosecutor Pat Hayden and then bring it to City Council for inclusion into Mini Code. We should expect that in the next couple of months, I'm hoping, um, so we can kind of get some truck traffic uh, calmed down on Highway 20. And that's all I have. Thank you, Chief. Hey, Council, anything for Chief? Dean. Well, I, 
I'd just like to say, Bill, I think the website looks great. And if anybody goes to it and looks at the fire department page, it was, it was correct it, about 10 years ago. So we, I will get that updated. I'll get the information to Bill. So if you go to it, half those people are no longer on the department. I think we still have Harold's name on there, so it's old. Um, <laughs> but um, in case you saw us um, running up and down uh, I-5 with the ladder truck going code, uh, we were called to uh, Mount Vernon uh, to the Lincoln Elementary School. They had a fire in their gym. Uh, so we took our truck over there today and deployed it out. Uh, didn't actually have to do anything. Found out it was just a burnt ballast. So uh, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of commotion over there in Mount Vernon. Shut down that section of town for a couple hours. And uh, they got the light bulbs changed. So anyway, <laughs> that's all I have, Mary. <laughs> well, I bet they're glad to know we have their back anyway. Yeah, they, they, we always tease them when we get over there. and They use our ladder truck because we make sure that they know that ours is larger than theirs. There, so. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. Patsy? Um, I'd like to point out to the council that the very last page in your packet is a report from Senior Services. We get those quarterly for Cedro Woolley Center specifically, and you can see monthly um, totals on number of lunches served and people in attendance and, and those sorts of things. So you can see how many people... I was going to say in the city, but in the city and surrounding area um, are using the senior center. Um, in the finance department, we've been busy trying to close out um, year end as, as a result of, um, I guess it was just the last meeting, paying the final bills for 2016. And so um, we hope to have that wrapped up fairly soon so we can bring some beginning balances over to 2017 and proceed as usual. Thank you, Patsy. Mark? Thank you, Mayor. Um, in your packet tonight under the consent calendar, you approve the Mayor signing the TIB uh, Complete Streets Agreement, and uh, we'll move to design phase on that as soon as we get confirmation that that's been approved. Uh, the projects that we've got included in that are the west side of the sidewalks on Third Street from Talcott up to State, and basically that's uh, that's not the complete block because some of that sidewalk is okay, uh, but it will uh, complete the rest of the uh, low quality sidewalks in there that access our high school, which we've had as a priority for some time. We also have uh, quite a bit of work that we need to do on Murdoch Street between uh, State and Ferry, as, you, as anybody that accesses uh, the museum or uh, the, uh, the Legion uh, building over there are aware. Uh, we didn't have enough money with the uh, Complete Streets grant as it, as it came out to complete all of that, but we're going to do as much of that as we can with that money. And then we're also going to put a couple of uh, rectangular rotating flashing beacons, similar to what we did at the uh, at the Duane Lane crossing on Ferry Street, uh, two of them on at the Cascade Middle School crossings on Highway 9, and then another one uh, down on, on State Street, uh, either for the Senior Center or the uh, State Street High School. So anyway, we're glad to see those funds, and we're going to make the best use of them we can. There'll be another opportunity on Complete Streets, not next year, but in 2018 for 2019 projects. As a part of that... <coughs> We're going to be taking a good look at our Complete Streets program. We were one of the very first agencies in the state to adopt that. And as it turns out, Tib made some comments to me about uh, it was uh, really not as, as um, attractive to them as some of the newer ones are, which I guess you could kind of expect. I was a little surprised, though. I didn't hear that beforehand. It was after the fact. Uh, but we're, we're going to take a look at that, and I'll bringing the, be bringing those recommendations to you over the next six months or so uh, to get those in place before the next round of TIB uh, things come up so that we can um, both qualify for that program again and increase the grant uh, amount available to us. And that's all I had for the night here. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Any questions? Aaron? Uh, just a reminder that our next meeting then will be on the 22nd at the beginning at 3.30, uh, and then we'll roll right into the regular council meeting at 7, and I'll pick the three of you up. Uh, the mayor and I will we'll start our rotation about 8 a.m., but I'll, I'll make sure you have our, our travel-specific agenda uh, probably by the end of this week, so you'll have all the details of our two days in Olympia. That's all I have for now. OK. 
Okay, Judith. I don't have anything. Jermaine? I just wanted to mention on the, so on the 12th, this is Sunday. Uh, I don't know exactly what time it starts. Maybe somebody else knows. They're doing a, a model train. They're going to be talk, like doing a model train oh, display yeah. at the um, at noon at the museum in Cedar Willie here. And I think that will be really cool for the kids. And another thing, uh, we'll have a meeting before this, but um, the Boys and Girls Club are selling tickets for their winter fundraiser. It's one of their big fundraisers. Um, we just had a community council meeting um, last night. And uh, the tickets are $20, and that's on, uh, gosh, is that the 20th? <laughs> is it 20, 20th? 25th. And, and the tickets are $20 for that. And they'll be shaving. We talked about shaving someone's head. Um, Most of it's already shaved, but <laughs> I don't think that. But we've never seen it completely <laughs> gone. So, you know, if you want your chance to see that. <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> Right, while we're on the topic of Boys and Girls Club, um, our girl from Cedar Woolley won Boys and Girls Award of the Year. I, I think that's the second year in a row, at least maybe the third. So that's starting to become a Cedar Woolley thing. And uh, very unusual because she was an eighth grader, which is very young. And it's, uh, it's a demanding uh, competition. And it requires a lot of maturity and speaking in front of groups, which I know is not that easy sometimes. So really proud out of our Boys and Girls Club up here who has developed those kids and brought them up like that. It's wonderful that we're winning. Brenda? Chuck? Rick? Did the current snow have any more impact on any of the streets and their freeze and thaw and pothole things and deteriorations, or is that too soon to tell you? A little soon to tell yet. Um, as, as you all uh, no doubt noticed, the crew was out at four on the day of the snow and had a pretty good shape on that uh, so that um, we didn't have the ice problem we would have otherwise. But we'll be taking a close look at that. Uh, and actually, I was going to mention, but uh, I didn't, that I, in my preparation of our TBD annual report, the Transportation Benefit District, I'm going to be taking a good look at the streets and reporting to you on the condition coming out of that. I already know uh, that Alexander Street took some significant damage. Uh, and there's a combination of some work that PUD was doing, plus the frost itself, plus the time that it had been since the last time uh, there had been uh, a chip seal on that. So we're going to have to alter what we're planning to do this, this summer as a result of the frost that we had this winter. So thank you. What about Fidalgo Street? We have a we have some work planned on Fidalgo uh, as well. Is that in the 400 block, 500 block, or is that on the east east of the township? Uh, I don't recall offhand what the actual blocks were, but they were the ones that weren't previously chip sealed. We were going to go out and finish that work as a part of the work. That's issue. It's in rough shape. Brett. Um, there was some discussion to it the last two meetings. I wanted to see maybe in a future council item um, a refining process for um, how the money is used in our um, our council determined fund or whatever that thing is called. That whatever that one's called. The city council. The city council. Yes, that's, yeah, fund. yeah, yeah. I like you know I I would like a discussion on how that money is used in, for future. So okay. Anything else, Brent? Right. Can I get us some nods from the city council if you're interested? So they will. Pull it. Oh, you didn't see it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, so they'll put it on. <laughs> it can be a discussion item. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. YMCA is a hot topic, so I guess I'll talk about it. And I understand that every time we spend money, we could have spent it somewhere else. But we do things all the time in concert with other partners, and we do things. And I'll, here's an example. The, uh, the Senior Center, that serves a small group of folks, about 45 to 60 people a day. But we're going to put a $20,000, probably more, air conditioning system in that this year. 35000 Oh, is it thirty five? Okay. And 22000 a year. Because we think it's the right thing to do. It's only going to help 
the people who use it, which aren't that many, but we do things like that all the time, and the county is our partner on that facility. We, we partner with a school to build baseball fields that only baseball players use. We partner with the city and the youth football league to build football fields that only football fields use. So we do things like this all the time. It's, it's not highly irregular. It's not unusual. We do it because it's right. Uh, we partnered with Rotary to build a skate park. Well, I'm never going to use that. Does that mean I'm going to be against it? No. Because when you're up here making decisions for the city, you take yourself out of what's best for me and how I would do it if it was me or how my lifestyle is. And you, and you put yourself in the shoes of as many people as you can imagine out there and figure out how it can benefit them. And I think that we made a correct decision to support the YMCA. And uh, in a couple of years, if I'm wrong, I'll say I was wrong. But I don't think that's the case right now. Say may be true of the air conditioner. The air conditioner, how old is it? I well, I'm not going to get in a debate with you, Harold, but there's never been an air conditioner in there before. So, without objection. I move that we, re, we, we, we go away. <laughs> Do I have a second? Go away might not be what you mean, but might be what some of you hope for. You mean move that we adjourn? <laughs> I would second we move that we adjourn. <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All in favor, rise and go home. You stand adjourned. One way was more is that you.